network of technical thinkers. Uh, let's see. Got it. Okay, there we go. Of uh, we're a big fan of and supporters of the Riot Org. Is there the glue that kind of keep the network of technical thinker and doers connected to the latest technology in a really fun way? Can't wait for your beer parties again, Frank. Uh, so once again, uh, welcome to the technical learning session for the PUI audio haptics section. Uh, we're going to pre was presented again by the Riot as well as the Aurora Technical Group. Uh, before we get going too far, I was just going to say a few words about the Aurora Technical Group. We are oh here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to talk introduce our our team. Uh, what are haptics? the different haptic technologies, a demo of the haptics, ideas for haptic applications, some resources and Q&A at the end. Uh, the Aurora Group is a premier representative organization for manufactured components, uh, electronic, mechanical, contract manufacturing and test services. And we've been around in this area for a quite a long time. Uh, we are committed to assisting and advising technical support on quality manufacturers, assisting in technical challenges of new and existing products, launching new technologies as well. And we act as your uh, supply liaison for quotes, order samples, expediting. Any questions at all about manufactured components, we can support you. We're located on the East Coast uh, in total, our particular section is the Southeast covering North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, sometimes Florida even. This is a look at our team. We have uh, Karen Brown in Georgia, Bob Kirkland in South Carolina, myself and Ken cover the North Carolina area and a little bit of the Northern part of South Carolina. And we have Bruce covering Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. And we also have our intern, Elisa, who is our market specialist on our team this year. So we're excited to have her. A uh, quick look at the market segments that we support, pretty much anything that takes IoT products, energy, telecom, military, aerospace, electromechanical components in general, heavy uh, focus on medical and technology areas such as telecom and so forth. So you can see the different areas that we work in. Here's a quick look at our portfolio. Uh, we really represent all these manufacturers, uh, Stock Drive, Radian, Taichen, Platronics, uh, and you can see the list here. And today we are highlighting PUI audio. Our presenters today are from PUI audio. We have uh, Neha, who is our Director of Innovation and Product Management at PUI audio. And she's been there for, started this year, and she's got a lot of really good experience in this area and she's quite passionate about developing a solutions with teams and solving real world problems in the PUI audio as well as haptics area. And we also have Kevin McKenna, who is our product specialist at PUI audio and he's got a lot of good experience with integration of audio products. So with that, I will like to turn it over to Neha to really talk about four technology areas within haptics. And that is new for POI audio that is being released this year. And we'll continue on with Neha. Thanks, Aparna. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are very excited to talk about haptics today. Uh, so I'll be focusing, as Aparna said, more on the, what, what the technology is and what are the different types of technologies out there. And then Kevin will uh, take over to go over some application. So um, let's start with uh, just in general, when, when it comes to haptics, people are still not familiar with this term. Um, so uh, when you think about haptics, um, it talks about sense of touch. So next slide, uh, Aparna, if you can go there. So um, I want to start with a general question about we have five senses and um, the question that we should be asking um, when we talk about haptics is, you know, uh, which sense would you give up the last if there's a choice? 
So most people are visual. They go with uh, sight. Um, so it would be interesting if you guys can type in your um, uh, answers in the chat window. It would be interesting to see the poll who wants to go with the touch uh, because touch is very underrepresentative uh, technology. It's, it's very important, but uh, not many of us uh, are aware of like what it can play, how it can play an important role into this product design to improve overall user experience. So it talks about sense of touch. This is the only sense that that's bi-directional. When you touch something, it provides something, some feedback to you to make you aware what you are touching, how you are feeling. So, um, you know, it's fascinating to know that some of the common devices that you see in the picture here, uh, the mouse, uh, steering wheel, we all use these in a common, um, in our daily lives. And some products, especially on the consumer side, they have already haptics. So, um, so next slide. So I want to go deeper into what are the different types of touch. When you talk about touch, there are two different types. One is known as tactile, cutaneous feedback which is more on your skin. So like fingertip uh, example would be like feeling the cloth on your skin. Um, so when, when you are in the cold weather, how your hands are feeling the temperature and sometimes it's hard to button. So, so things like that um, talks about tactile feedbacks. It's usually wearable. So some of the pictures you see here, it's an Apple Watch. Um, many of you may be aware that Apple recently, a few years ago, uh, developed this haptic engine patented. Um, they have patents for this. Uh, the other picture talks about um, Facebook Reality Labs came up with the uh, glove that, that um, is playing an important role in AR, VR space. The other type of technology is the force feedback. This, these are the sensation that you feel through the muscles and limbs. Example would be pushing a door open. You are uh, doing, uh, feeling the force, how much force uh, you need to apply. So these um, devices are usually grounded. So some of the commonly known devices are from Geomagic, Novend, and Microsoft. And there are many out there. Uh, but the differentiation between these two are like the force feedback devices are pretty expensive and cost is pretty high. So there has been still new development for this technology, how we can make user experience better. So it feels real as well as it's uh, how, how it can be cost effective given the value it, this technology provides. So that's the general high level feedback. Um, next slide. So I, I want to also share some other application um, that you might be more familiar with. So the top pictures you see are the consumer goods that I talked to you guys, that we uh, interact with them on a daily basis. Some of you might be gamers, you know, like on that uh, PlayStation, when you um, playing a game and experience tactile feedback, those are the haptic devices in those knobs that uh, makes those game more uh, interactive and useful. Um, and same with the Apple Watch or any type of um, physical training devices that we um, start to use more often. So it's, it's providing more uh, useful uh, and benefits in, like when it comes to improving the performance for athletes, um, that, that's when uh, these devices and new technologies are uh, trying to provide more value to the user. Um, you also see um, a lady with the belt. So it, it's sort of wearable where it's providing and helping her in maybe sort of uh, posture correction or um, you can imagine for walk-in balance, um, it can also be used as a, a walk-in balancer for elderly people. So there are a lot of other application and usefulness for wearables um, and consumer application. 
The pictures on the bottom shows um, new areas and where haptics is not, has taken um, a prominent place. We are still trying to figure the value. Um, so for example, in medical, uh, the, more, the main important part here is um, you see ro robots there. So um, surgeons started to do tele uh, surgery. Um, there, there's minimal invasive surgeries out there that, that's done by robotics, but also surgeon is helping. So where haptics is useful is um, there are like audio visual uh, technologies out there. And I, I think in this, um, live, our user is already, which is surgeon, is already overloaded with the information. So the goal here for haptics technology is how to minimize that information overload. So surgeon don't have to see on the screen, he already feels maybe by wearing something or giving an alert in real time feedback. So that's, that's the benefit of um, trying to figure out how we can make things better. Um, and there's still study going on, um, which does this technology provides value to certain application. It, it's also taking a play, um, pro providing value in education and simulation. So you can imagine when, when it's time to training, especially in the medical field, when, when it's so hard to perform um, a new operation, so new doctors doing something, um, what it would feel like if they already can experience um, based on the expertise, expert surgeons out there, how can they do surgeries better by simulation? Um, so, so there's a lot of advantages uh, to study and how we can uh, improve user experience. Next slide. So now I'm going to focus more on like overall technology differences. Um, and I'm going to explain all these um, acronyms that you see out there. But I want you to focus on the left hand side, um, some of the parameters that are out there. So the key things to note for all the actuators. So I'm going to use start using this term actuators. So when it uh, and focus on hardware. Um, you, you, can, you can think about actuator slash motor. Basically the function is how, how to convert an electrical signal into vibration slash um, um, haptics feedback. So, so when it comes to different technology, it talks about size. So sometimes footprint play a critical role. Um, availability of the product which type is more prominent and we have broader uh, SKUs out there. Uh, what's the cost um, uh, competitiveness? What's the voltage requirement? Um, how efficient it is if it's consuming high power versus low? What's the direction of the vibration given the um, signal that user is inputting on the screen? Uh, the displacement and acceleration is a key part, like depending on how strong that feedback you want, you would want to choose between these different technology that provide better acceleration, or you may not require a stronger feedback for some application. Um, frequency also play a key role, and that has been the challenge for haptics technology in general, because our skin uh, have different mechanoreceptors throughout the body, our fingertip have function more better at different frequency versus our hand. So it all depends on like how user is interacting with the device. So that's how it becomes very important to consider frequency, um, what you're trying to achieve out of the device. And last not but the least is the response time. So any motor, when you start and stop, it consumes a lot of power. Um, it also play a critical role. It has to be quick uh, because when you feel something, when you touch something, you want quick feedback. You don't want to be delayed. If the response time is not optimized or it's not quick, um, you're basically gonna annoy or make user feel like it's it's not providing what they are looking for from that device and technology. So 
Uh, these are all just rough numbers what I have put out there, but I'm gonna summarize once I explain each and every technology. So I'm gonna revisit. Um, next slide. So let me start with ERM. It stands for eccentric rotating mass. Um, both ERM and LRA are electromagnetic um, motors. They are basically, so ERM is a DC based. Um, it, it requires very small voltage to drive. Um, you can see here towards the very left, uh, the mass that is attached, that's what it is performing the function. It's uh, basically providing the displacement in a repetitive manner when it when it starts to rotate. Um, so, so again, this this comes in various forms. You have cord, you have coreless motor, and you also have brushless motor, which is more expensive, but it improves reliability. But these days we have a very uh, long lead time for uh, brushless type of motor because of the specific uh, driver chip that's being used that's in shortage. So mostly we, we are seeing the demand is on um, uh, coreless ERM type of uh, actuators. All right, so next slide. So this is linear resonate actuator. Linear, it provides um, vibration in a certain, like just one axis versus ERM was two direction, two axis. Um, so it, depending on like device and user input, uh, you can choose linear actuator. The benefit for uh, e LRA over ERM is really um, the, um, voltage, when you apply voltage, like the acceleration and the displacement can be fluctuated independent versus ERM is pretty constant. And this LRA uh, op works best when it matches the resonant frequency of the spring that is attached to the mass. So both ERM and LRA have a mass attached. So it basically make use of that mass to provide vibration. Next slide. So this is talking about voice coil actuator. Uh, the principle is pretty similar as a speaker. Um, you can see instead of moving the diaphragm uh, on the right hand side, we are moving the mass. Um, so um, the benefit is similar, as I said, in for LRA, this is also linear actuator, but it's just voice coil. Uh, it, it provides broader frequency range compared to LRA was specific to a free, uh, resonant frequency where it uh, optimize and work best, but this provides broader uh, frequency range when it comes to providing uh, vibration feedback. So you can see the differences between like how the output is changing based on the frequency. Uh, again, acceleration and frequency can be controlled both by voltage and frequency. So um, next slide. I think the last one is the piezo, which is different. It's not electromagnetic, but it um, if you guys are familiar with uh, buzzers or benders, this is again um, based on um, that principle of when you apply voltage, basically the material that's in there, it expands and contracts, causing it to warp up and down and provide vibration and displacement. So um, this is less prominent compared to ERM and LRA because uh, it takes some complexity, it, it is, it works on high voltage and that's the uh, downside of this. Uh, many um, electronics companies are developing specific driver to optimize the uh, voltage level and how we can better um, utilize this technology. The benefit uh, it provides is really the footprint and uh, one other variable that it allows to be controlled independently is the position. So now you have 
position, amplitude, and frequency that can be controlled independently. So it allows you to provide more complex type of vibration feedback that you would not be able to get from ERM and LRA. Um, so it, it also provides really fast startup and response time. So Kevin is showing you different, as I'm talking, uh, he's showing different footprints. So right now this is uh, encapsulated in silicon. So that's, that's the type of flat, flat piezo that we have. Uh, he also showed the stack ring type. Um, so there are different um, footprints within this, but it's pretty, a pretty very small and provides good feedback. Um, so a great technology to have and explore. So now um, I'm gonna come back to the summary slide just to summarize um, before that. So, so this is just more graphical view. Um, you can go to the next slide, Aparna. Um, so this is just showing you different uh, graphs um, and it's comparing frequency to acceleration. So haptics in general, it works from zero to 300. That's, that's where our human body receptors work. Um, and then above that, it goes beyond and it doesn't, uh, doesn't um, work as great as audio. So you can see, we talked about LRA, uh, which is showing the peak. It only have a best performance at a specific frequency. So it works best at a specific frequency. VCA, which is in the middle, you can see it also has a peak, but it also provides some broader uh, frequency to work with. Uh, and piezo also, uh, it's a non-magnetic. It also provides larger bandwidth. And one of the good thing is low power consumption that more, many of the designers really find it very useful to make it efficient. Um, the second graph also talks about similar things. It's just uh, have different large, middle to small ERM, how it compares to some of the other technologies. So VCA, we have uh, two different footprints. You can see on the top, we have flat type. And then on the second graph, you can see a cylindrical type. So there are many footprints available for each type of technology. All right, next slide. So this is again, uh, going back to the summary slide. Uh, we have highlighted some of the benefits that uh, who is the winner for each parameter. So you can see those things in the green. For example, LRA is in the Apple um, uh, devices and it, it is very um, good product. It just work on a specific it, uh, frequency, but it is a winner when it comes to just having that small footprint. It's also easy to apply. It comes with an adhesive. Uh, you just uh, uh, apply um, by removing the tape. So um, for assembly, it also becomes very useful. Piezo, as I said, is very useful when it comes to flat screens um, and not taking too much space. Piezo doesn't have a mass compared to LRA and ERM. So the beauty of uh, Piezo is that you can use other system components as a mass to provide different type of vibrations. So it can be stronger and lighter depending on how it is enclosed, how it, what type of enclosure it is attached to. So it becomes very handy. It basically use um, um, system components as a mass compared to ERM and LRA. Um, and then, um, I think that's that's all I have. Um, There's a so, question here from uh, the audience. Uh, do you mix different types in the same device? Different types of haptic technology in the same device, like haptic, like piezo and ERM. You can you can use it. Uh, I think it depends on what kind of system it is. If it's a complex system, like for example, in surgery, um, um, medical application, um, 
if it's a full system, then I think it might be um, good to apply different type of technology. For example, the gloves that we were showing before that was developed by Meta, it has different type of actuators that are being applied. So on fingertips, it would be maybe LRA. On the hands, it would be ERM. So, so yes, uh, it depends on the application. Uh, but generally speaking, I think, for example, just on Apple Watch, it would be just one uh, device, LRA, but, but it, it can be a combination too. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin to talk more about applications. Hey everyone, um, that was actually a great time to ask that uh, last question about using multiple types of haptic devices in a single system. Um, so before I get into the nitty gritty of it, I wanted to kind of just talk about a, a system level view of something that could incorporate haptics in a few different ways. Um, one such example is a car. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with sitting in your car and as you're driving down the road, the steering wheel is buzzing because you're too far in the left lane and your, your, your car entertainment system's beeping at you and you know everything's making noise or trying to get your attention. So haptics could be used in a situation like this to minimize the distraction to the driver, uh, making sure they still have their eyes on the road, but they're still able to get feedback from the things that are going on around them without it necessarily necessarily pulling all of their attention away. Um, so to talk about how you could use some different ones, just as a kind of easy example, um, I mentioned the steering wheel. <clears throat> so in the top left there, I have the ERM pointed at the top of the steering wheel. Uh, something like that could be used where if you drift into the other lane or you start to, I don't know, another car comes a little close to you, it'll just give you a general vibration, um, just an alert to tell you, hey, something's going on. <clears throat> and the, the benefit of that is the, um, the force that the ERM motors will give you is not specific to one direction. Because the mass is rotating, you can kind of feel it as a general buzz. Now, if you look down below it, we have a VCA also integrated into the steering wheel. What you could do with something like that, since it, it does take up a larger form factor, so it may have to be designed into whatever you're using but that can reproduce a little bit more accurately of a tone in a certain direction. So say your car needed to warn you, hey, turn right or turn left, rather than a overall alert. Well, the VCA could do that, and it can also do it in a specific waveform that the ERM really can't do as accurately. That'll give you a little bit more of a specific alert without pulling your attention away, and you can use both in the same sort of situation depending on what the alert needs are. Now, those are usually paired with something else. So think about the infotainment center, excuse me, the infotainment system in the car. Um, that's where we have the LRA over on the right side. Something like that, the, the feedback is in one direction, just like how the VCA is. But imagine you're driving the car and you reach over to touch the touchscreen. You don't wanna necessarily look down away from the road and start fiddling with it but you wanna be able to get, get some sort of feedback to know you've pressed the right buttons. So using something like an LRA and integrating it with the audio of the car can give you both types of feedback. You get an alert audio, excuse me, you get an audio alert letting you know, ding, you've touched the right button, but after the button gets pressed, you get a little feedback. And that would be more similar to think of typing on your phone when you tap on the keyboard and it gives you those little clicks. So it doesn't pull your attention entirely away, but you don't have to look directly at what you're doing to gauge the feedback. All three of those can be used at the same time, integrated with audio or other alerts. So that way you have a wide range of responses from the car to what you're doing. Um, the last one is that I wanted to talk about in, say, a car or some other situation is the piezo element. So with the wide range of form factors and ways you can integrate piezo elements, it, it kind of ties the rest of them together. So envision a flat piezo, say, woven into your car seat. If you're driving and the car really needs to get your attention, there's something wrong. Well, your whole seat could start vibrating. 
maybe not enough to throw you out of your seat, but enough to really grab your attention without making you look away from the road. Or you can integrate it in some sort of fun way. Um, say that's hooked up to your car's stereo system. Instead of the big booming bass at a stoplight, the piezo in your car seat kind of gives you that same sort of feedback. Pair it with the audio in your car, you feel like you have a pretty full system, but it saves a lot of, it, it keeps your attention where it needs to be. It's subtle, it gives you benefits, but it doesn't pull your attention away from where you need to be focused. Um, let's go on and move to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about how you drive them and how it kind of works all together. So the very first thing to think of, be it you integrating it into a car or an IoT product or a medical application, it's always about the user. What is the user doing? What do they need and where do you need to go? So we'll get a little bit more into the user side stuff later, but there is always going to be a user of some sort. The user will provide an input <clears throat> Excuse me. The user will provide some sort of input, which talks to a computer. There's a million different kinds you can use, um, but almost every single haptic system for accurate responses uses some sort of microprocessor, microcontroller, computer. Um, again, we'll get a little bit more into that later. So after the user inputs something, the microcontroller responds. It'll send some sort of signal to some sort of drive circuit. And that's where the power of, excuse me, that's where the power comes from to actually make the actuator do something. So <clears throat> if you look at this one, there's various uh, signal patterns coming under number one from the microcontroller, which go to a drive circuit, which then go to some actuator. And we'll talk about selection and stuff here in a little while as well. But those are those three things need to work together with the user to provide the feedback you're looking for. So let's go a little bit more in depth. Move to the next slide. I'll take a drink real quick. All right. So this is going to talk a little bit about power, um, how it gets powered, and what you can do to do it. So if we're talking about the most simple situations where you just need something to turn on and go, well, something like an ERM can be hooked up directly to a battery. It runs on a direct current, so DC voltage, constant, meaning any sort of battery can power it. The downside is you're very limited in control. It'll just basically turn on and off with it being connected to um, a power source. It can get a little bit more complex, though. If you look at number two there, that is a transistor-based drive circuit. So this is, this is where we try to not get too technical on you, but the microcontroller would talk to this drive circuit. Talk is not a great word here. Rather, it controls the drive circuit. And you can use the microcontroller to control how fast the circuit is powering the device and then powering it, say, in reverse to stop it quickly. Or you can you know, write a specific line of patterns that the microcontroller will execute through the drive circuit. That gives you a little bit more flexibility on what the actual motor can do. And that's how you'll drive things besides ERMs. If you just hooked up a one of the LRAs that we were talking about, the ones that move in a single direction to a DC source, nothing will happen. It needs a fluctuation in power, an AC signal up and down. And that's what the drive circuits like the H bridge provide. And that's what that is, is an H bridge. So that gets a little technical. Let's simplify it a little. There are companies that make specially designed driver chips to power haptic devices. And generally that's the most simple way and efficient way to just get something working. So I have here pictured a chip from TI. It's the 2605L and it's designed to drive ERM and LRA motors. Something like that has a library that, oh man, I think there's over 120 effects pre-programmed into it and you use your microcontroller to send it, um, a simple code to it, and it will know exactly what you want to do, how fast to power it, how long to power it, what it needs to do without you having to coordinate every single aspect of that drive. Um, they also make a really good one for the piezo elements. <clears throat> Neha had uh, mentioned that it's a little bit more complex to drive those. They require high voltage, 
and they're just a little finicky. So in an application like that, finding a driver chip, which incorporates a drive circuit and pre-programmed effects, levels, and things like that will make your life a lot easier, at least on the design side of stuff. Um, let's go to the next slide. So after you've figured out what you're powering it with, how you're controlling it, it's time to start designing what you're gonna do with the haptic device. And again, this is where you really need to consider the user. So think about a, uh, just any chime, you know, be it the chime to that when the door opens in your office or your car door, whatever. You naturally respond differently to certain types of audio responses. Um, it's kind of exemplified here on under number one, under the rhythm. So when you hear a chime going up in pitch, you naturally think, oh, that's a success. I've done something. If you hear a constant tone, you think, oh, something is going on. And if you hear a tone going down, usually that means some sort of failure. Think of when your phone dies, it gives you that do do do. And the same sort of thing can be replicated with haptic effects, usually in tandem with the same sort of audio effect. So if we're talking about the rhythm, if the haptic device starts buzzing a little bit more intensely as something is executed, when you're holding the device or it's touching you, you'll naturally think that something has been completed. It has started somewhere and gone somewhere, therefore something must have happened. Same could be said if it starts somewhere and goes down somewhere. It's declined, something bad's gone, or something has stopped. And if you pair that with your audio devices, you get that understanding even if you're half listening or half feeling. It's always there in some way or another. If something's continually happening, a constant tone may be heard, or your hand might be constantly buzzed by whatever you're gripping. If you're holding a game controller and you're driving a car, it'll constantly be buzzing. When you accelerate, the, uh, the haptic feedback will increase as you accelerate, or if you brake, it'll decelerate. So those are all sort of things to think about. You wanna pair the rhythm with what your natural response to an audio alert would be in that situation. We look at number two, it's the same sort of idea. How sharp is the feedback you're getting? Is it a really quick alert or does it slowly buzz you and gently remind you? Um, that again can be integrated if you, in the same way audio would be. Um, think of your alarm clock. That's not a soft alert. It turns on and it starts yelling at you. Hey, wake up, beep, beep, beep. If you were wearing an Apple watch, you wouldn't want your alert when you first wake up to be something really soft and subtle. And you might sleep through it. You want it to be a sharp alert. Opposite's true as well. If you are driving a car and your phone's in do not disturb mode, when you get a phone call, you don't want your phone going crazy. You want it to softly alert you, if at all, hey, there's something going on. So thinking about how abrupt or how sharp the haptic effect is, again, it makes sense to kind of extrapolate it to what you would know from hearing an alert. You can kind of tailor how much focus gets pulled away. It, that leads into the volume. It's very similar to how sharp it is, but you wanna you know, consider the amplitude of the effect. Is it gonna be an alert when your watch buzzes that makes your wrist like hurt, like, ow, that was a really strong effect? Or does it just kind of nudge you and let you know, hey, you got a text message, check it whenever you want. All of those sorts of things, when you think about it, you, it makes a lot of sense to think about it in terms of audio. That's what people are familiar with. And haptics generally play the same way in terms of stimulation and um, pulling focus. You keep hearing me talk about focus and that's a pretty big aspect of how you design and program for alerts. Don't pull focus away, keep focus on what you're doing, but give enough stimulation so the user accurately knows what they're being alerted to. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So with all of that in mind, let's talk about what you need to consider overall when you're integrating haptics into something. And I'm gonna stress it again. First thing you wanna think about is the user, always. After you've figured out what the user is gonna be doing, think about what else in the system has the capability to alert them. Is it a, a, a smartwatch that has speakers built into it? Um, is it a car where there's car speakers? 
what other things can you pair with the haptic device to let you know what's going on? Um, if you only have one or the other, think back to Neha's example at the beginning where we were talking about the five senses. If you lost just one, it's probably not too detrimental, but you don't wanna lose more than one. You're, you're pretty much left in the dark if you do. If you have too many senses coming at you at once though, you're overwhelmed. And that's when you wanna make sure with a haptic device, you implement multiple cues to give a better experience, but you're not overwhelming anybody. So that kind of leads into point number two. You wanna have a purpose and a reason you're implementing these things. It, is, it's pretty cool if your, your pen can buzz while you write, but what benefit does that bring you? If it's a pen style device like a stylus that a surgeon is using, well, that would probably provide some benefit if there was some feedback. So pair the user with the other alerts, figure out what's going on and decide what you want your feedback and why. So with that in mind, think about um, how I mentioned again earlier, your phone. When you're typing on your, your keyboard on your phone, you're familiar with the alerts. You're probably familiar at this point with the vibration when your phone's on vibrate and what those different vibrations mean. Those are familiar to the user. And that circles back to where we were talking about focus before. Focus doesn't want to get, you don't want the focus of the user to get completely stolen by whatever device you're using. So having a few default effects that they'll quickly learn and quickly know what they mean will benefit them a lot more than having 50 different options that all do one thing. Choose something default, keep it familiar, and keep the focus where it needs to be. That way they know what's going on still. Getting into a little bit more technical stuff, um, haptic devices can very quickly kill your battery if you leave them on and ready to go all the time. Think about your, I keep using the examples of the phone, but it's what everybody's really familiar with. If your phone's haptic device was primed and ready to go constantly, that means it's constantly got power to the driver board. It's constantly got power to the signal source. And you'll notice the effects of that pretty quickly. So when you design it in, first figure out what your battery source is going to be, and then figure out how you can put that into standby at all times at all times possible. The longer it's in standby, excuse me, the longer it's in standby, the better the battery life overall is gonna be and the more power will be available when it needs it. So if you have a really weak battery source, putting it in standby may not be enough when you turn it on and it needs to do a big alert. So you have to consider the actual size of the battery and power source overall as well. Talking about kind of the rest of the system, if you want to effectively make it work, it's not going to bring a lot of benefit when it's limited to just one app or device or aspect of whatever product you're doing. So that's point number five. Consider what it can do with other apps. The, again, your phone. There are options for every single app on your phone, every single function on your phone. Everything can use the haptic device at some point in time that brings a lot of benefit to your phone. It's a great value add if a piece of your product works for anything anybody would wanna do with it, with it working in an effective way. You gotta be careful with point number five, because like I said in point number three, if there's 50 different ways it can respond and each one does something unique, that brings a lot of confusion if you start integrating it to other apps, but it'll bring a lot of value if you can do it efficiently. Finally, what direction is it being used? Do you need it to alert you in a 360 degree motion? Similar to what an ERM, excuse me, similar to what an ERM would provide. Or is it something like your phone where it's always in your hand, therefore the feedback will be up and down rather than in a circular motion. That will help you decide what type of actuator you need. And when you look at point four, you can decide what specific product you need from that line of actuators, depending on the power requirements, depending on the battery requirements, so on and so forth. So again, we'll say it one more time at the bottom here, keep the user in mind. When you set out to design it or do anything with it, always look at what the requirements of the user are first and where, 
you go from there will naturally follow if you have effectively designed your device for the user. Um, before we go in any further, I do have some examples over here. Um, if you look on the side view in your Zoom call, there should be another presenter called Kevin McKenna. That's myself. It's just our second camera view here. But these are just some general examples of haptic devices. So Neha is holding it up here to the camera for us. This is just kind of an in-house prototyping kit I put together um, so we can play with some stuff and we can swap motors as we need and just so us techs can get an idea of what's going on. But it gives a good view of a system level design broken out into a larger scale. If you're looking at something inside your phone, all of these components probably fit into the size of a quarter or so. Very hard to show though. The component here, this is the microcontroller we were using. That's a Raspberry Pi Pico. It's a $4 microcontroller, but you don't really need a lot of processing power if you're pairing it with driver chips. So these are chips that already have the programming and the effects put into them. They can do a lot of thinking. The microcontroller is basically just telling them, hey, I want to turn on, I want you to turn off, figure it out for me. And they tend to do that themselves. So I'll just show you real quick what they can do. You have a few different options here. And it's, I apologize, it's gonna be a little difficult to actually understand what they're doing because you can't feel these physically, but I'm just gonna trigger some effects and you can see the devices start to respond. If you look here at the ERM, this is a transition effect. Like if your phone was starting to charge or maybe the battery was dying. There's a couple pulses. It zooms up to 100% and then slowly backs its way down. Move over here. This is a flat VCA LRA device. So the technology on these ones is a little blurred between the LRA and VCA tech, but they operate very similar at the end of the day. A magnet moves up and down in one direction. So when I play the same sort of effect through this device, not sure if you can hear that on the microphone, but it makes a little bit more audible noise. And you can see the platform flexing vertically when I do that. So something like that is what you find in phones, albeit on a smaller scale. The one that I'm showing right now would be possibly something you'd find in a car steering wheel or the tap screen in your car. Finally, this is the VCA. It uses, again, the same sort of technology as LRAs and this flat LRA, but it's in a cylindrical form factor. These are a little bit closer to audio effects. That's what you'll find in game controllers, things where you hear something and feel it at the same time a lot of the times. When I play the effect through that one, you don't see a lot of movement. I can feel it, but, and again, I apologize if the microphone doesn't pick this up you can audibly hear the tone it's playing. I'll hold it up here to our other camera in hopes that you can actually hear it. But it just plays a simple tone through it as it goes. Something like that, it's just a prototype kit, but it, you can see it broken out and you can visual, visualize the signal flow between devices. From there, I want to grab a couple of those just so we can show them a little closer. So some other stuff you can do besides just, you know, press buttons, turn them on and off. These are charged up all the way. So this is a handheld haptic device. Depending on the operation and the microcontroller that they're using, this might see, actually, how many, People in here are probably familiar with the Wii and the original Wii remotes. This is the technology that they use way back when, but simplified significantly just for showing off. Um, depending on the microprocessor that's used with it, you can control things like an accelerometer swing and it'll respond and buzz if you hit a tennis ball like Wii Sports or something. Or you can integrate that with things like technology today like uh, VR. If you're playing VR, 
and you swing a sword, you need a response of some sort. It'll be pretty discombobulating if you can't see what's going on because you're in a VR goggle set and you're trying to gauge where your, your in input is and you have no feedback. So different form factors, different installations give you different effects depending on the haptic device you use. Kind of an overarching theme is it does what it does in the situation you put it in. If you put- That's a, that's a great question, uh, yeah. Kevin, or the, the way you posed it. Uh, we actually have about five minutes left uh, oh. in our presentation here. We got a great question. That's a, uh, a great segue to what you just said. And a uh, question from the audience, are there different types of haptics that work better in loud and high uh, vibration environments like construction or ag? Yeah. When you're in that environment and you want something that really gets the user's attention that's not audio. What do you suggest? Well, first, it depends on what, what it is that's giving you that feedback. If somebody's in, say, a, a, a Bobcat um, or a, some sort of construction equipment, they're going to need some sort of different feedback compared to a handheld um, carbon monoxide reader or something like that. Generally, though, piezo elements are going to give you the highest, strongest feedback. So if it's a critical situation, piezo elements tend to do very well. They do need a little bit more control and circuitry, though. If it's something handheld, a LRA that's a little larger, that takes a higher power, uh, higher power rating will perform just as well. It, it, it really just depends on what they're going into. For the strongest feedback though, you're generally looking at piezo elements, especially in, if, if it's construction or something dangerous, you need to get somebody's alert. That usually is the way people end up going. And one of the benefits we are seeing in the market today for noisy environment is we start to see how haptics can provide value where they are um, providing noise cancellation effects. So that, that's a great benefit of uh, haptics that it can actually improve user experience and uh, lower the sound level for the user. That's great. Yeah. We have any other uh, there's no more other questions. Uh, the last slide is basically a summary side of yeah. a lot of information. We will send out you know, the full presentation as well as the video of this to all who registered. Uh, if there are any last comments, please put them in the chat box you, or you can just come off mute and ask the question. We're pretty well done with our presentation. Thank you very much. Kevin and Neha for all that insightful information on haptics. Thanks for having us. And thanks for everybody for tuning in and, and listening to us. Any last questions? Any last advice? Uh, I, the only thing I've got to say is if you've got questions, just please reach out to the Aurora group or also uh, PUI Audio, and we'll be happy to help you. Uh, here's all our contact information that will also be sent out on an email as well. And I'll, I'll say one last parting word. If anybody is has, has watched this and decided they're interested in using haptics, the best advice I can give is pick up a couple of components, find a, you know, an Arduino or some similar cheap microcontroller and play with it yourself for a while. They're physical devices. You have to feel them to understand what's going on. And once you go down that route, you can really understand what your product can do with them. That's it. Any, anything else, Neha? Yeah, I, I will just say um, that haptics, unlike audio and visual, it's a new technology. There are so many broad applications. Um, and I think it's up to us uh, how we can uh, define next revolution on our product design to improve overall user experience. So it's very exciting for us and hope you get to learn uh, something from us and uh, explore how to use it. So thank you. Thank you all very much for that wonderful presentation. And if there are no further questions, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all again. Thank you. Everyone. 
Thank you.